Oh, good morning, everyone. How are you? I am so excited to have uh, our live reading today. We are with the Book Fairies, and we are going through our readathon. It's May, and what does that mean? It's Literacy Month. We're raising awareness for and funds for the Book Fairies mission of getting books into the hands of our neighbors in need. I want to do a heartfelt thank you to our sponsor top sponsors, which include Amazon and Michael Sorreo, who is our honoree from First Central Savings Bank. If anybody wants to be a part of this mission, they still can. You can join the Readathon. You can still create a page. Uh, you can still donate to the Readathon. We'll put a link on our Facebook page for you to do that. But today I'm excited because we have you back. We have Nick Rule back again. Nick is a freelance illustrator and cartoonist who also lives in New York. And he is here today to go over and read Bad Kitty Makes a Movie. Hi, Nick. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for continuing to invite me to be a part of Book Fairies. I appreciate it tremendously. Well, you are a huge supporter of ours. We're so grateful to have you here, to have your talent and bring you into the to the classrooms and let them, the, the students that we and the teachers that we support, um, see all the talent that you have and ask you questions. And you are chock full of um, entertainment and lots of things that you have to get underway. So I'm not even going to stay on any longer. I'm going to let you take control and I will come back when you are ready for me and we can ask some questions. So all the teachers and students get your um, put into the chat the questions that you have and um, we will be back when you are ready. All right. Thank you. Lovely. I am now in control. So thank you for joining me as you've all gathered by now. My name is Mo Will, sorry, Nick Brule. And I have this amazing job where I get to write and illustrate books for kids like you. Best part of this job, this job where I get to write and illustrate books for kids like you is that every now and then it gives me the opportunity to actually meet kids like you, albeit sometimes virtually like right now. So having said that, this is what we're going to do. This is going to how happen in four steps. Step one, I'm going to read to you from the newest Bad Kitty chapter book, this one right here, Bad Kitty Makes a Movie. After that, we're going to do two drawing exercises. And I mentioned that to you now because now would be a really good time for you to get a few sheets of paper and maybe a pencil or a pen if you wanna draw along. If you don't, it's perfectly fine by me if you just sit back and watch. And then after all that, I'm gonna answer as many questions as I possibly can in the time that we have. All right, well, but first, Bad Kitty Makes a Movie. Now, before I read to you from this book, I want to explain something. Now, clearly, this is a Bad Kitty book. I mean, there's her name in the title. That's her on the front. But if you look really carefully, I'm going to see if I can zoom the book in. If you look really, 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 really carefully, you can see peeking out from inside the stretch limo is Uncle Murray. There's a reason for that. The reason is this book is just as much about Uncle Murray as it is about Kitty herself, which has inspired me to tell a story I love to tell. It's the story of why Uncle Murray even exists in a bad Kitty book. And to do that, I have to go all the way back to when I was making the very, very, very first bad Kitty book. This is the cover, although it's a printout. This is the very first bad Kitty book. It was called simply Bad Kitty. All right. It was a picture book. It was a very simple story, if you don't know it, about a cat who doesn't get the food she wants one day. And the food is listed in alphabetical order. So she commits all these acts of mayhem and retaliation in alphabetical order. But then she does get the food she wants in alphabetical order, and she more or less makes amends in alphabetical order. When I was writing the alphabet, of the foods and animals that this cat wanted to eat, I got to the letter U and I was stumped. I mean, I was stuck for days. I could not think of a food or an animal that started with the letter U. I mean, yes, they're unicorns, but they don't really exist. It didn't seem to fit with my book. So I thought about this for a while and one day it occurred to me, wouldn't it be kind of funny 
if for the letter U, I wrote uncle someone. And if it was going to be uncle anybody, it had to be my own real life uncle Murray. When I was a kid, I had a real life uncle Murray. And so I decided to depict him as I remembered him. This is the very first appearance of Uncle Murray in a Bad Kitty book. There he is. He was sort of big, kind of doughy, mostly bald. I'd visit him at home. So he was always walking around in a stained gray t-shirt and pajama pants. And I loved my Uncle Murray. My Uncle Murray used to tell me stories that were possibly inappropriate for my age about his friendship with a famous Hollywood comedy team called Abbott and Costello. Now, a lot of you kids, you might not know who Abbott and Costello are, but a lot of the big people in your life, your teachers, your parents, your family, they should know who Abbott and Costello are. So I'm going to give everyone a little bit of homework. Don't worry, you'll like it. When you get home, talk to whoever it is that streams, downloads, rents, purchases movies. Have them find a movie called Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Excuse me. Need a little life-affirming coffee. <clears throat> Sorry, something got stuck there. When you are sitting there and watching Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, which, by the way, if you like funny movies, you'll love this movie. If you like scary movies, it's not too scary. You'll love this movie. When you're watching Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein, you can point to the screen. And you can say, hey, those two guys used to play poker every Thursday night with the real life Uncle Murray. That was my Uncle Murray. So this is what we're going to do. I'm going to read to you from chapter two of Bad Kitty Makes a Movie, which means I need to do a few things first. First, I need to tell you what happens in chapter one. This is a book about what happens when Uncle Murray accidentally makes a video of himself in battle with Kitty and a housefly. Then he accidentally uploads the video to the internet where it becomes this instantaneous viral sensation. The second thing I need to do is kind of prepare you a little bit, okay? Because, and to do that, I, I, I gotta give you a little background about myself. I was born in a small town called New York City. Maybe you've heard of it. It's one of those quaint villages where everybody knows your name, where everybody greets you outside with a hello, good morning, a friendly how do you do, and where the, the, the subways always smell like vanilla. And the reason I mentioned this is that when I do my Uncle Murray voice, which you'll hear in a moment, I give him a New York accent because the real Uncle Murray, that's what he had. But I found that Uncle Murray is regional. So if people are reading Uncle Murray in the South, they give him a Southern accent, right? In the New England, they give him a Boston accent. In, 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 in Texas, they give him a Texan accent. Me, I give him a Brooklyn accent. The third thing is I could use a little what we call um, audience participation. So you'll, you'll know this when it happens, but there's going to come a point in the chapter where I'd like everybody who can hear me to sing in their most beautiful sing-songy voice go like that, okay? We're going to practice this first, all right? I'm going to do this on three, and at three, I'd like everybody to go like that, all right? Here we go. One, two, three, beautiful. Chapter two. A bad kitty makes a movie. Early the next morning, there's Murray. He's been in bed up all night watching his own video, and he says, it's been viewed over a million times. A million times! I've been liked thousands and thousands and thousands of times! Me! wee dee doo dee doo dee doo goes his phone. Whoa, who could be calling me at this hour? Hello. Yes, I'm Uncle Murray. Yes, that's my video. Did I do something wrong? Yeah, I know the cat that's in that video. Yeah, I know where she lives. Did I do something wrong? Who is this? For real? 
You're a powerful executive at a super big Hollywood studio, and you want to make a what? You're an incredibly powerful executive at a super duper big Hollywood studio, and you want to make an epic movie based on my video? Holy salami. What do you need me to do? You need me where? You need me to go to Hollywood? The Hollywood? The Hollywood with all the movie stars and classy restaurants and movie stars and palm trees and movie stars and fancy sidewalks and movie stars and that giant sign and movie stars and movie stars and movie stars? You got it. I'll be there. Yes, sir. When do you want me? Tomorrow morning. Gosh, that's not a lot of time. I was planning to get a haircut tomorrow. I mean, I don't have a lot of hair, but still. And you want me to bring the cat? Uh, you've seen that video, right? So you've seen that cat. I I'm not so sure. No, make the movie. I'll be there tomorrow morning and I'll bring the cat. I promise. Make the movie. Make the movie. Thank you. Goodbye. Tap goes Uncle Murray. End goes the call. One minute, 29 seconds later, knock, knock, blam, knock, blam, oh. Uncle Murray, what's going on? Where's the goofy cat? We have to go to Hollywood and make a movie. We have to leave right now. Right now. Calm down, Uncle Murray. Start over, but more calmly. Where is the goofy cat? We have to go to Hollywood to make our movie. And we have to leave right now. Right now. There you are, you gorgeous, beautiful, fabulous, goofy cat, you. We gotta go. You and me are gonna be big time Hollywood movie stars. What are you talking about, Uncle Murray? I just got a call from a super big time Hollywood movie studio that wants to make a movie based on the video I made. And they want me and the cat to star in it. And get this, they're gonna call it Kitty the Movie. Isn't that a nifty title? Kitty, the movie. Yawn, goes Kitty. So what do you say, cat? You wanna be you wanna become a big time Hollywood movie star? There, says Kitty. No? Really? Then do you wanna help me become a big time Hollywood movie star? Hmm. Fair, says Kitty. Don't you wanna help me become rich and famous and beloved by millions and be that guy who people point to on the street and say, Hey, that's Uncle Murray over there wearing a tuxedo and driving a fancy sports car and eating caviar and steak and giving out autographs. He was in that movie I saw. He's even more handsome in real life. Don't you want to help me be that guy? And Kitty goes, uh, 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 ahem, on three. One, two, three. Five says Kitty. Nice cat. Real nice. I guess I'll just have to go and... Guess I'll just have to go and eat all that shrimp by myself. Oh, yeah. Hollywood is just filled with shrimp. It's everywhere. It's actually a big problem. They don't know what to do with all the shrimp they have all over the place. Oh no, my pockets are too full of shrimp. I could just give some to a hungry cat, but I'll throw it out instead. See, in Hollywood, every corner has its own shrimp fountain that constantly flows with shrimp and sprays it out to anyone who wants some. And some of those shrimp are as big as cars. No, wait, buses. People actually ride around on them. You want to go to Beverly Hills? Well, just climb onto that giant shrimp over there and it'll bring you. Uncle Murray, I don't think that's true. Shh. Don't stifle her curiosity. Yes, we're going to Hollywood. Let's grab your stuff, cat. There's no time to lose. I got your bed, some toys, lots of food, and your litter box. I'm not forgetting your litter box this time. 
Let's go, let's go, let's go. Hollywood, here we come. Good luck, Kitty. Good luck, Uncle Murray. You're going to need it. The end of chapter two of Bad Kitty Makes a Movie. And the best way to find out what kind of mayhem Kitty and Murray get into when they get to Hollywood would be to get your hands on a copy of Bad Kitty Makes a Movie, now available in finer bookstores and libraries everywhere. Meanwhile, I want to show you something. I want to do a little exercise with you about comics. So interesting things happened in the past several years. These books, Bad Kitty Makes a Movie is one of them. They kind of become graphic novels, right? I mean, there's characters, there's color, there's frames. There's... So what I thought I would do is show you how you can make your own comics. But I want to do it a little differently because... Over the years, I've run into both kids and grown-ups, and I mean that seriously, who say they love comics. They'd love to make their own comics, but they tell me they don't know how to draw. Does this sound familiar? They want to make comics, but they don't know how to draw. And I get why that would trouble someone, because... Comics are unique. They tell a story with both words and pictures. And if you don't know how to draw the pictures, that feels like it could be a problem. I'm here to tell you that that's not a problem. I'm going to show you how you can make comics if you don't know how to draw. And I'm going to do it, go back to my handy dandy fancy schmancy document camera. So this is what we're going to do. I have a blank sheet of paper here. And the very first thing we're gonna do to make a comic is we have to make a box or a square. Some people call frame, but in the conventional nomenclature, this is called a panel. All comics have panels. And by the way, they don't have to be rectangles or squares. They can be any shape you want them to be. They can be, triangles, it can be circles, anything. But for the simplicity's sake, we're just going to make this a, a rectangle. I'm now going to create a character. And it's as simple as it can possibly be. I'm just going to draw a dot. There it is. See that? That's it. That's all the drawing I'm going to do right now. So, because we can pretend that that dot is anything we want it to be. That dot, it could be just a dot, but maybe it's somebody that's standing very, very far away. I think for the purpose of this exercise, I'm gonna say that is an ant, just a tiny ant. Now, remember, comics are stories with words and pictures. So here's my picture. If I was to tell this as a story with just words, it would read, once upon a time, there was an ant. And that's it. The ant. Not, not exactly compelling literature, right? So I'm going to do something a little different that you can do in comics. And that I'm going to give this ant something to say. Now, a lot of people draw word balloons, but I'm just going to draw, write the word hi. And then I'm going to draw a line to the ant. Now, if I was to take this comic and turn it into just words, it would read, once upon a time there was an ant who said, hi, the end. Hmm. Again, not exactly a, a full enough story, right? So I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna do this over again, but I'm gonna have the ant say something a little different this time. Now I'm gonna make my rectangle a little smaller this time. And, 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 and that's because I want to leave a little more room on my paper, right? So there's my panel. There's my ant. But now instead of having the ant say just hi, I'm going to have it say something perhaps a little more interesting. I'm going to say, have this ant say, I'm lonely. I did something really important here. I gave this character feelings. I made this character instantly a lot more interesting just by what it was saying. 
So now I have a frame. And if I was to write this as a story, it's a little more compelling. It would read, once upon a time, there was an aunt who said, I'm lonely. I want to move on from here. And by the way, I could have had the aunt say anything, right? I could have said this, the aunt say, I'm happy, I'm angry, I'm sad. I just thought I'd write, I'm lonely. When we, in comics, when we want to add to our story, we add more panels. So I'm going to add another panel next to this one. There's my aunt again. Now I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to add another ant, another dot. And I think I'm going to have this one. I can have this ant, this new ant say anything. I'm going to have this ant say, do you want to play? All right. I've got a story starting here, right? Because now if I was to put it, this into just words, it would read, once upon a time, there was an ant who said, I'm lonely. Then another ant came along and said, do you want to play? I'm not done yet, right? I'm going to add another pen because we're going to continue our story. And I'm going to draw my two dots because I have one ant here and I have my new ant here. If I wanted to end the story right now, I would have the first ant say, yes, because it would say, once upon a time, there was an ant who said, I'm lonely. Another ant came along and said, do you want to play? And the first said, ant said, yes. But I'm going to make it a little more interesting. I'm going to add something really important to stories. I'm going to add a little bit of conflict. And I'm going to do that by saying, by going against what is the obvious, I'm going to have this ant say, no. Now it's your turn. I want you to take this very simple story about two dots, about two ants. The first who said, I'm lonely. The second who said, do you want to play? And the first who said, then said, no. And I want you to continue this story. And you can do it very simply just by adding more panels. And this is the, something you can certainly do by yourself. But remember, you've got a lot of tools that you can use from here on. And I'm going to just show you a few of them, right? You have your two ants. Maybe. You can have them moving a little closer. We can do that by putting the two dots closer to each other like there. Maybe you can add one dot and a lot of more dots because more ants came along. Maybe you can add, have the two dots and maybe add a bird. It's whatever you want it to be. This is your story from here on. You can start with these three and then do whatever you want. And by the way, you can add more paper. It doesn't have to be just these few panels. Well, I hope that looked interesting. This is an exercise I've done with grownups and with kids. And it's really about storytelling because again, that's what comics do. They tell stories with words, and pictures, but please don't be discouraged if you're not sure you can draw the pictures because you can just tell your story with a couple of dots. Now let's draw Kitty. I want to show I want to show you how to draw a bad Kitty, but at the same time, I don't want to be the guy who gets a big blank beautiful sheet of paper, gets a marker in his hand, and then says, "Okay, kids, this is how you draw a bad Kitty." I want to make it more interesting. And I'm going to do that by showing you the hardest part. I'm going to show you the thing that challenges me more than anything else every single time I have to draw this character. And that's giving her feelings, emotions. You remember how I gave the ant a feeling? And I did that really simply by having the ant say, I'm 
lonely, but I've got a problem. It's kind of a big problem. My problem is that I created a character who does not talk. Kitty doesn't talk. She's a cat. So she can't just tell us what she's thinking. She can't just tell us what she's feeling. The only way to know what Kitty is thinking or feeling is by seeing the expressions on her face. And to do that, I'm going to draw Kitty. And to show you how, I'm going to switch over to my handy dandy fancy schmancy document count. All right, so in order, to, let me show you how I draw Kitty. When I'm drawing Kitty, I always start in the middle of her face with that part of the body called the elbow. Wait, that. That that doesn't sound right. Let, let me let me um, review my anatomy here. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees and toes. Head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, and eyes and ears and mouth and nose, 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 nose. That's her nose. I knew that. You should have said something. Anyway, doesn't matter. We're moving on. The lower nose. I'm going to draw her mouth. Above her nose, I'm going to draw these two circles. And these two circles, of course, are her. Pancreas. Wait, that 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 doesn't sound right. Let, let me review my anatomy here. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes, and eyes. Eyes, eyes, those are eyes. I knew that. You should have said something. Anyway, moving on. Above her eyes, I'm going to draw these four hairy deals. Like that. Next come her ears. Now, this part is very important. After years of exhaustive research, I have learned that all cats have two ears. So I always give Kitty two ears, if only for the sake of scientific authenticity. Next came her whiskery deals. Now you'll notice what I did was three whiskers or three points. The one in the middle is always a little longer than the other two, just sort of bounces her head. All right, I did that on one side. Now I'm gonna do it on the other side. Ready, here we go. Do a little bump and then one, two, three. We are almost done. I'm going to wrap things up with her skinny neck, her shoulders, and maybe that little tuft of white fur on her chest. And that's Kitty. Hi, Kitty. But I'm not really done yet, you see, because I call this blank face Kitty. She doesn't really have an expression. You cannot look at this face and say for certain what she's thinking. You certainly cannot look at this face and know for certain what she is feeling. That is about to change because with a single stroke of this marker, I'm gonna turn this blank expressionless kitty into annoyed kitty. This is gonna happen quickly, so pay attention. Here we go. No expression, annoyed, in case you missed it the first time. No expression, annoyed. No expression, annoyed. You see, the smallest detail can make a huge difference. It's knowing where to put that detail. That's my challenge. To further illustrate this point, I'm gonna do this three more times. But to save time, I am not gonna bother drawing her whole head. I'm not going to draw all the details of her head. So for instance, I'm not going to bother with certain things like her hair or her ears or her whiskers or her pancreas or her gallbladder or your, her, her shin bone. I'm just going to draw the important components of her face. But you may have already noticed that I'm making those two circles a little bigger this time, and you'll see why. All right, so here I have three kitty faces. They're pretty much the same, right? They're pretty much identical, but they're also incomplete. Something is missing. Well, by the time I'm finished, this first one is going to be surprised kitty, all right? This next one here is going to be crazy kitty. This last one down here is going to be adorable kitty. Are you ready? Here we go. First things first, surprise kitty. Are you ready? Here we go. 
one, two. That was easy, right? But check this out. All I did was add two dots. Dots can be powerful things, as it turns out, right? First, they can be ants, but now they can bring a face to life. Because look at how much more alive that face is compared to the other two. I never get tired of that. All right, next, crazy kitty. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two. That wasn't so hard. Last but not least, adorable kitty. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two. I had three kitty faces. They used to be the same. They used to be identical. By the time I I was done, the only difference between surprised, crazy, and adorable was where I put the dots for her eyes and how big I made them. Learning these details, the ones that make such a huge difference, took me a lot of time, a lot of practice. It still remains to this day the hardest part of my job when I have to draw this character. I now open the floor to any questions that you guys may have. Well, thank you so much. That learning, that uh, lesson about uh, drawing the little boxes and how you can take just two little dots and really make it into something is incredible. That's a great lesson for all the children that are on this um, on this panel and and watching what's going on. So now we know a little bit more about Bad Kitty Makes a Movie. So it's Uncle Murray, and I do know Abbott and Costello. And that's is that a true story? That is an absolutely true story. My Uncle Murray had something to do with the entertainment industry. He wasn't in movies, but he was he was maybe a, 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 a an agent of some sort. I was too young to really understand what he did. And by the time I knew him, he had retired from it anyway. Um, but that's that was my Uncle Murray. Wow. So I think most of the teachers are probably excited about that more than the kids, <laughs> which is great. Um, Katie asked, did you go to school? Uh, did you go to school to learn how to draw or is oh, it just? It's a terrific question. Um, so yes and no. I mean, when I was your age, when I was in elementary school, I was always drawing. I really loved to cartoon and cartooning is basically telling short, small stories with words and pictures, kind of like what we we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but I went to when, when it was time for me to go to college, I actually entered college on something called a pre-med program, which meant that I was taking classes that would qualify me to apply to medical school, which would qualify me to eventually become a doctor. But the interesting thing about college is that sometimes the most important things that happen in college are not the things that happen inside classrooms. So, so something funny happened. It was right in the middle of, uh, right after my second year in college that an opportunity fell in my lap to have the comic strip on the campus newspaper. And I decided to, to, to jump at that opportunity, see if I could do it. And for the next two years, I had the comic strip inside the campus newspaper. And I learned two things, essentially. Not only how to tell stories with words and pictures, and I had to do this every single week, and I couldn't miss my deadlines. I had to hand it in by noon on Fridays if it was going to come out in the newspaper on, on Tuesdays. The second thing I learned was that this was what I truly love to do. I love doing this more than anything else. It wasn't even something I was doing inside the classrooms. Wow. It was something that but I learned that I loved writing and drawing stories more than anything else. It gave me great joy. And that's why that was around the time I decided to dedicate my life to it. Wow. Pre-med or writing cartoons. I think you chose the right path, obviously. Um, so, which kind of dovetails that. into Leo asked, did you write books first or draw books first? So you kind of answered that, right? It was kind of. Yeah, it kind of happened at the same time. I mean, my. My goal when I was young was to, to be a cartoonist, to write and draw simultaneously, okay. either cartoons for newspaper and magazines or for comic books, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and, but in the long run, you know, you could say I wasn't 
what I learned to do and what I always wanted to do was be a storyteller. I don't even think of myself as somebody who writes and illustrates my books. I'm somebody who tells a story with words and pictures. Oh, well, that's well said. Miss Reddy just wanted to say that you really presented a fabulous way of drawing to make it easier for children, which is the goal, right? So get everybody, you know, excited about it. And anybody can do, you know, it's your imagination, right? That's what it's about. That's awesome. Um, and then Ella wanted to know, do you, do you have a kitty that made you want to write Bad Kitty? Oh, interesting. Um, when I made the very first Bad Kitty book, I showed you a picture of it, the, the cover. Mm -hmm. um, did not have a cat at the time. Um, so Kitty's personality is kind of more or less loosely based on lots of cats that I'd known throughout my lifetime. But when I had to figure out what Kitty would look like, that's when I actually thought about a cat I had when I was a little boy named Zuzu. The um, cat was named Zuzu, not me, anyway. <laughs> Zuzu was had a great design. She was a little cat. Even for a cat, she was kind of small, but she had this beautiful design where she was all, all black, all over, from the tip of her ears to the tip of her tail, except for this elegant little tuft of white fur on her chest. And I always thought she looked like she was wearing a piece of jewelry. So when I was thinking about what I would have um, Kitty look like, I thought of Zuzu. And uh, boy, am I glad I did, because uh, I think she, she, her design has really sustained itself throughout all these books now. That's awesome. Um, and then is there anything that you would like to um, share for, the, aside from everything that you've done, any other tricks that you'd like to share for the kids or if they want to start drawing or writing? Other than what you just shared, is there any other tricks that you have up your sleeve? You know, it's not a trick so much as a word of advice. And this is the word of advice I would give to anybody who wants to make stories, whether they're kids or grownups, it doesn't matter. And, and it's very simple, just two words. And that is uh, be brave. And I mean that in two different ways. Be brave in the kind of story you want to tell. Um, whether it's just very personal or something you're really imagining it, it, don't worry about whether you think someone else is going to like it, be brave in the kind of story you want to tell. But the other re way I mean it is that once you've created that story, be brave enough to share that story with someone else. Maybe it's a friend or your parents or a teacher, because if you want to find a way to become a professional writer, if you want to get published someday, then you're going to have to be brave enough then to share your story with the rest of the world. So you might as well take the steps to be brave enough to share the story with the people around you. It, it's, it's kind of shocking to imagine, but it's very true that a lot of people have a lot of trouble sharing their stories, their creation with the people around them. Maybe it's too embarrassing. I don't know. Um, for instance, I have a very good friend who's a brilliant writer, but the world may never know because she will only share her stories with the people closest to her. And even when she's been invited by editors to share her work with them, she won't do it. It's And it troubles me sometimes to think about that. So be brave. Be brave in the kind of stories you want to tell and be brave enough to share those stories with everyone around you. Those That's are my well, that's an that's an awesome in everything that you do, be brave. So that's I think that's a really great takeaway. We have time for one last question. And Regina said um, she's watching through Facebook. She said, I'm allergic to cats. Ooh. Had Kitty ever encountered someone allergic to her? You know, it's actually something I've contemplated because um, I, I, I have not really tackled the topic of allergies yet with Kitty. Um What's interesting about what you say is I, I actually do, I'm working on a middle grade novel. It's the first novel that, that I've ever written for, for, you know, six, seven, eighth graders. And, and it's, it's about a cat because I guess I'm pigeonholing me myself into that theme about a boy who finds a cat and cat allergies is an underlying topic of discussion in this book. One of the things that I've learned in my years, and this might be useful to you, is that some people who are allergic to cats 
are much more allergic to male cats than female cats. My wife is one of them. Wow. Um, we've had if if because the 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 protein that's in the dander that people are allergic to that people react to is much more concentrated in male cats than in female cats. So even though we had a cat once that shed like crazy, um, she was a female cat and my wife had no reactions to her. But when we had a male kitten in our house for a little bit, she had incredible reactions. Um, so, so it's a topic I've explored. It's a topic I cover in this middle grade novel. And whether I'm gonna put it into a bad kitty book, I don't know. I always need new subjects to explore. So that might be one of them in the future. Thank you. Good suggestion, Regina. Well, thank you so much. You took lots of lessons here today, how to draw a bad kitty, how to write a comic strip, to be brave. And uh, your next new hit might be about allerg an allergic cat. <laughs> True. So thank you so much for always being such an entertaining um, visitor with us. To all the teachers that are on, we want to thank them. We had 17 classes here. Uh, we want to thank each and every one of them for joining us. Um, and we hope you'll be back soon. And thank you for your support of Book Fairies because uh, our mission is important and we're grateful to everyone who participates in it and yourself included. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Take care of yourselves. Bye, Bye. everyone.